Okay, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in, uh, today for this webinar. I'm Dita Skatagi, and I'm director of the California Complete Count Census 2020 office. This is the third time I will be undertaking this role. And I'm very pleased to have um, technology that can help us that we didn't have in 2000 or 2010. Uh, and we're working through it. So we appreciate everybody's patience. So the purpose of today's webinar is to educate Census 2020 stakeholders about the importance of outreach to people with disabilities and how to encourage their participation in the decennial census. We also wanna engage with disability advocates and leaders so that California census outreach efforts are inclusive of people with disabilities. And finally, to inform the disability community about the importance of responding to Census 2020. So while the responsibility of the census enumeration operations and related data management rests solely with the U.S. Census Bureau, the state campaign supplements and seeks to increase outreach efforts that are done by the U.S. Census Bureau, but also to reach all Californians to ensure that they respond. The California Complete Office will conduct a robust outreach campaign to reach and activate hard-to-count Californians, including people with disabilities. I'm pleased to open this first webinar on the critical importance of including people with disabilities in the Census 2020. So I'd like to turn it over to So Wing Bong, who has led the discussions around disability inclusion at our California Complete Count Committee. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to wait a second while our camera person comes on. Great. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Census 2020 webinar, Inclusion of People with Disabilities. So I want to start off by saying uh, it's coming April 2020, and the federal government is going to start counting every single person in California and in the nation. But we do have some challenges ahead. People with disabilities in the past have been hard to count and have not been counting the numbers that they should be. So today, uh, we're fortunate to have the wonderful panelists that we will, that will speak about how we can improve that, how can we, how we can ensure that everybody with disabilities is actually counted. Why does it matter, right? Um, we are here today, and we're spending this time with you today to let you know that a lot is at stake there are over $675 billion uh, that, that is um, essentially doled out to the state and, and to different um, programs using census data. And that includes the number of representatives, it includes uh, Section 8 housing vouchers, it includes special, ed special education programs. There's a whole lot at stake. Uh, and with that said, we want to make sure that people with disabilities and the communities that are going to help count people with disabilities are aware of what the issues are, and, and here the panelists speak about what some of the solutions may be. Uh, I am very fortunate uh, to first be able to introduce you to Margaret Jacobson Johnson. She's our immediate past as advocacy director for Disability Rights California. And Kyla, it's going to be just for a second while we come around so that we can see Margaret. Hello, everyone. I'm Margaret Johnson, as Sewing pointed out. And I'm going to talk this morning about a toolkit that we developed. We're calling it the 2020 Census Disability Community Toolkit. And I believe it's being made available to everyone that's on the webinar. Um, we did that toolkit in collaboration with Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund in Berkeley. Um, and it was supported by a grant from the California Community Foundation. The purpose of the grant was to conduct focus groups and listening sessions to hear from people with disabilities about the U.S. Census and how they participate and learn about their past experiences, get their reactions to some outreach messages, and to help organizations be more inclusive of people with disabilities and their outreach for the 2020 Census. So that was the point of what we did. So I'm gonna go through a little bit about what we learned. And we had four focus groups of six people each and four listening sessions with 44 participants. Um, participants had so uh, psychosocial disabilities, intellectual and developmental disabilities, and physical disabilities. Some people were blind, hearing impaired, and parents of children with disabilities. So we have a pretty robust group of people that we um, had in our group. 
Um, unfortunately, the funding was limited to Southern California, so the sessions were held in Riverside and Los Angeles counties. So it was really specific to that area. Um, we had ethnic and socioeconomically diverse people participate, and we had people that have been living on the streets and people who were previously institutionalized. So I think that we had a pretty broad group of people that participated in this. Um, we wanted to know what um, people with disabilities want to know about the census. And people with disabilities generally want to know the same thing that other hard to reach communities want to know. They want to know what it is and why it's important. So only a few of the people we talked to knew much about the census. About half of them had heard about it, but only nine people knew that the results determined how many representatives we have in DC. Each person we talked to became more engaged and interested once they heard, as I think Filling pointed out earlier, that the census determines how more than $600 billion worth a year in important resources for all Americans including people with disabilities, is distributed to the state. Um, they were responded to the fact that the census determines funds for SNAP, um, children's health programs, special education, supports for foster youth, and funding for Medicaid. So those were important things that they um, were interested in knowing about the census that really got them more engaged and participating. Of the people that we met with, only 13% of them had ever completed the U.S. Census. So this really shows, I think, that um, people with disabilities are really underrepresented in the census. Um, we also asked people why they don't complete the census, assuming that they even got it. Um, and we asked, have you ever completed it? And this is what we heard. I've never been asked. I don't think the census has an impact on my life. I have trouble completing forms, and I'm worried information will be used against me. And the last one, um, I feel needs a little explanation. A lot of times people with disabilities are really concerned that providing personal information might interfere with their ability to get Social Security, Medi-Cal, and other kinds of benefits. And that is particularly concerning for people who've waited for years even to get an eligibility determination to receive these kinds of services or Mm -hmm. And we also asked why people would participate, and the reasons people will participate include um, if surveys are conducted in partnership with a trusted group, so a trusted community group will help people feel that they can actually participate and that there will be a trustworthy relationship. Um, and that could be like community organizations, service providers, or other kinds of advocacy groups. Um, the other thing is that people, if people can understand the census will be helpful for them and other people with disabilities. So really making the census bigger than just them. Um, and again, this goes back to the comments about making sure that people understand that it really helps um, with a lot of benefits and services that people need in order to participate and function in the society, larger society. Um, people also wanted to complete surveys in a place where they feel comfortable. That might be an independent living center, a frequently visited community center, or even a church. Um, people also wanted information in accessible format. So that might um, include something that's readable by a screen reader program, um, Braille or in American Sign Language. Um, another uh, reason people would participate is when information is provided in plain language. Um, and then finally, um, it could be that in person or with the support of someone they trust when completing the survey on a computer or using a smartphone app. That wasn't necessarily true for everyone, but some people felt like they really needed the help and support. Um, the preferred messages that we found, we um, tested, I don't know, maybe 10 messages, and out of those, three resonated with people, and the first one that resonated was the 2020 census, the disability community is counting on you. So that was one of the messages. 
Another message that resonated was the 2020 census and disability. Everyone deserves to be counted. And then the third message that resonated was why the disability community matters when counting the 2020 census. Um, we also um, tested hashtags, and the one that resonated was hashtag disability count 2020. So when people are doing outreach to the community, might want to try using one of these messages that resonated and use that hashtag. And then um, we also um, looked at outreach factors for people to consider, and those included things like making sure to provide access when you're doing outreach, whether it's asked for or not, um, and then to be aware that not all people identify as disabled and the things that um, impact that include things like a person's age, their economic and cultural factors, and stigma. Um, a lot of people uh, feel like having a disability is stigmatizing and may not want to disclose that they have a disability. Um, in addition, some communities have um, uh, impact from communication, by communication, so you want to make sure that you're using plain language so people with intellectual or developmental disabilities can um, understand. Uh, you want to make sure that you're using American Sign Language, real-time transcription at events, um, Braille, large print, screen reader friendly websites, things like that. So um, the other speakers here today will get into more detail, I'm sure, on some of that. But just generally in the um, in our uh, uh, document, we made sure to list like some of these things so that you can remember and then reach out to other sources to make sure that you understand that. And then finally, this one may not seem that obvious to people, but use images of people with disabilities in your outreach material. Um, I think that showing a person with a disability when you're doing your outreach materials um, really lets people know that you're interested in hearing from people with disabilities. Um, and we encourage you to use imagery that uh, avoid using red flags like images that use standard, uncustomized hospital issued wheelchairs, for example, or scenes that depict people with disabilities in, in, in isolation or institutions. Instead, really try to use disability images that show people in real life situations uh, doing a variety of things alongside friends, family members, or colleagues. Um, so, those are some of the outreach factors that we identified. Um, the toolkit also includes, includes some resources. Most of those are um, targeted towards Southern California, but some of the resources in the toolkit are statewide. And I thought that we were putting together um, some resources that we'd be distributing to people generally as part of this webinar. Um, and I'm sure Sloan can say more about that if she comes back. So I'm kind of wrapped up on what my toolkit covers. Um, I'm not sure if we were doing questions at the end of each thing or at the end end. Yeah. I guess we're doing it at the end end. So I'll turn it back to Sally right. and she can introduce the next speaker. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, I see in the dialogue box that folks are asking about the, the slides. Um, we are, because we have many speakers and we have a short amount of time, one screen is going to be dedicated to the ASL interpreters. So the other one will be roving around to ensure that everyone can see the speakers. All materials, including the toolkits that Margaret spoke about, including the PowerPoint she is using, and all resource materials we'll be providing to you will be provided to all attendees after the webinar. So um, that is um, what we're doing to ensure that all everyone could be um, could have full access of the of this panel. So thank you so much for Margaret for that. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce you to Sherry Farina. Sherry is the CEO of NorCal Services for Deaf and Hard of Hearing. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Sherry, Sherry Farino, Rina. And in addition to being the CEO of NorCal, I'm also the chair of the California Coalition Agency for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing. So first, I just wanted to kind of share some facts briefly about our deaf community. So the use of that word, that term, deaf, really people don't tend to use hearing impaired anymore. 
they will use the word deaf or hard of hearing to identify. And deaf really encompasses a wide range of individuals with varying degrees of hearing loss and hearing levels and communication preferences and language for communication, such as ASL, English, um, et cetera. Studies have shown that deaf people face extraordinary challenges in finding and retaining their jobs. Despite the mandate with the Americans with Disabilities Act, since that was supposed to strengthen the hiring process and the provision of reasonable accommodations for all individuals with disabilities, several studies have found that even with training, laws, and an increasing awareness, gradual increase of awareness of the needs of the employees who are deaf, the employment rate itself still for the deaf population is lower than the rate of comparatively with the hearing population. The reasons for that higher level of unemployment rate within the deaf community varies, but it can be contributed to the employer's hiring practices, misconceptions, and also just attitudes. Our population is very diverse. There's a lot of different backgrounds, different cultures, and within each culture, you know, within the Black community, Hispanic community, Latino, Asian, they have deaf people. There are deaf people included. So for, for the census, deaf people don't always identify themselves as disabled. A lot of times they're looking for where it says deaf or hard of hearing or other options. Cult, they place their culture of being deaf before that identity of disability. They consider disability people or people who have disabilities people in a wheelchair, not someone who doesn't have the ability to hear. Approximately 15% of the total population um, are individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing, deaf blind, deaf plus, and that actually equates to roughly about 5.9 million residents who are deaf or hard of hearing. And 43% of that population live in a household where language is used from another country other than English. And within that number of individuals who are deaf and hard of hearing, those are residents who are from linguistically um, isolated households. The education background is another factor as well. Um, many, about, I would say 90% of deaf or hard of hearing individuals are born to a hearing family with hearing parents who might not be aware of what to do and oftentimes aren't, won't introduce a language until later. And we know that's a very critical period for learning from age zero to five for children to acquire language. So if they aren't acquiring that language acquisition at that time, then oftentimes there is a language deprivation and a language barrier that ensues. And that's the reason why with the census, it's very important to use English sentences very clearly on the survey. But that can also be a barrier for some deaf and hard of hearing individuals who may be more able to read you know, or understand the question. So we recommend for people who are involved with the census in every county to make sure that they include the governor, the same with the governor's office, that they include ASL on the menu as an option so that people can see that and pick that option for accessibility. That way they can access all of the information for the survey and have that split screen with the question and then another screen with the question signed in American Sign Language. We should caption all media, all media materials. It's very important that hard of hearing and anyone who needs that access can see visually the sentences and the language in the census. 
in addition to someone signing or using a video. And, and if you're using a video, it's important to pick someone themselves who actually is deaf to show them in the video so we can show the true representation of the language. And we also should use deaf people to be part of the outreach in general. Especially. Especially if you're going to be going to push people in homes that obviously if the deaf people don't understand, you know, your spoken language, maybe you could write back and forth and that's always not the best way to do it either. So we have eight sister agencies in California, in the state of California. I'm sorry to, I'm sorry to interrupt for a second. Sherry, if it's okay if you don't voice, because the captioning is picking your voice and her voice. So if you can just sign so that it just picks up her voice, because the captioning is picking up both. So if you can just sign without voicing, she'll, and it can just pick up one voice. Oh, uh -huh. great, thank you so much. Sorry, I didn't even realize that. Um, so where was I? So we have eight sister agencies throughout the state in different regions of California. And we all have contracts with CSS, Deaf Access Program itself, DAP. So if you feel stuck, you're not sure what to do, the best thing to do would be to contact the DAP office, the Office of Deaf Access, or me directly. And I can direct you to the most appropriate local deaf agency in your area, and they can work with you or they can refer you to other people who might be able to go to your area or to another agency to help maybe interpret or to interpret documents, translate them into ASL if needed for them to respond to the survey. And again, my name is Sherry. And if you can contact me, you can contact me via email at SS. A R I N H A at N O R C A L C E N T E R dot org O R G. Or you can call me 916-349-7500. And if you want information about the closest step agency to you and provide you with assistance, we are so happy to help. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sherry. Um, you're a wonderful resource to the community and you're um, always willing and, and passionate um, advocacy for individuals in the deaf and deaf plus community. Uh, the next speaker is Jeff Tom. You can tell me when. <laughs> the next speaker is Jeff Tom, who is the immediate past president of the California Council of the Blind. One moment. All right. Give us one second. I don't want to talk about the whole thing. Okay. okay, good morning, everyone. First, I want to thank uh, the Complete Count Committee and all of the um, organizations that helped organize and arrange for this webinar. For many complex and numerous reasons that I won't even mention today, I think that people with disabilities are certainly one of the largest underrepresented groups in the census and especially here in California. So I want to focus my remarks um, in two areas. First, I want to mention three significant segments of the blindness community that I think we need to focus on in terms of getting um, effective census data. And secondly, the best ways to go about um, the outreach for those particular communities. <clears throat> the first segment are K through 12 students who are blind or who have low vision. Many of these students also have other disabilities as well, um, and I'll come back to that. Um, but disabilities include hearing impairments and intellectual disabilities especially. Uh, the, the funding that is impacted includes many types of services, the provision of technology, um, the teaching of Braille or the ability to use 
low vision aids and materials, the understanding and navigating in one's environment, which for persons with vision loss is known as orientation and mobility, independent living skills such as the ability to prepare meals, uh, the ability to use a checkbook, um, you know, uh, dressing appropriately, socialization such as learning about personal space, learning about dating and human sexuality, and many, many more skill sets that blind children don't acquire, e acquire as easily as sighted children do. In addition, of course, teacher training funding is impacted by census data. And as with other segments uh, in the teaching community, there is a severe shortage, shortage of programs and teachers for the blind and visually impaired. The second segment are working age adults. This used to be the 18 to 64 population, but now it has really expanded in two directions. First, um, due to federal law and other circumstances, uh, we are putting much more emphasis on transition youth um, of high school age. Secondly, seniors with vision loss, like other seniors, want to remain in the workforce. With the proper training uh, and sometimes modifications in their jobs, many can either perform the same job that they did before they lost their vision or change into a new job. The final segment and the big elephant in the room as far as the blindness community is concerned is seniors themselves. Our 55 and over population comprises more than half of us. I'm proud to say since I'm one of them. <laughs> um, and people 55 years and over who lose their vision need a variety of service services, including some of the ones that our children need, like orientation and mobility uh, and independent living skills, but also including mental health and peer support. Um, they have to fight the isolation and the sense of the absence of self-worth that they acquire when they first lose their vision. They also may be dealing with hearing impairments, a significant uh, portion of the low vision senior community does have a hearing impairment. So having looked a little bit at these segments, now how do we outreach to these particular groups? Let's first look at uh, the K through 12 student population. And of course, it, with a few exceptions, for there are a few uh, adults in that population, most of them have to be um, reached through their parents. So how do we get there? I think that the best way that the Census Office can help to reach these parents is to work with both the California Department of Education and at the local level with county offices of education, school districts, and special education local planning areas. And even more than that, getting information into the teachers of the visually impaired and orientation and mobility specialists who really have the one-on-one -on -one relationships with parents. Obviously, the materials have to be language appropriate because we are dealing with many minority communities and culturally appropriate. And yes, as has been stressed before, there is definitely a problem with stigmatization. A lot of parents for a variety of reasons, do not want their children labeled as blind or having other disabilities. They are scared and they think it in some ways will hurt their children and will even hurt themselves. Um, I think it's important that we deal with various organizations that California is uh, lucky to have. For example, California has groups of educators of the visually impaired um, and has groups of orientation and mobility specialists. And some of these resources will be placed in the resource guide that you are going to be receiving. And finally, let's turn to um, the two sets of adults. And I think I'm gonna handle these as one. 
working age adults and seniors. Although there are some areas in which they have separate categories of outreach. One of the senior categories in which we are very lucky in California is that we have a series of approximately 20 agencies and some independent living centers as well that serve blind persons specifically. Um, it is important that uh, these, these entities receive their money through the Department of Rehabilitation. So uh, through that department and individually with these agencies, they have a very easy way to reach out to seniors who have low vision and or blind. Obviously, the materials must be in large print and braille format. Um, large print will probably reach far more, but, you, but certainly there's still a significant number, like myself, who use braille. Um, in terms of videos, um, just as you have captioning for those who are deaf and hard of hearing, um, it is important to have audio description for uh, videos that uh, people who are blind or low vision are going to see. We want to know what is going on in that video and audio description, which is a method of um, basically uh, describing the dialogue, uh, and this, sorry, describing the visual aspects of the video is extremely important for our population. There are, uh, it is also important that we use um, cultural organizations in the minority communities as well, because oftentimes it is very hard to reach seniors in those communities, except through those types of organizations. Um, and you know, you know, we have focused so much on high tech solutions, I'm going to focus on a low tech solution. Uh, a lot of times our seniors, even though they have used technology before they lost their vision, aren't yet trained to use technology after they lose it. But if they have a wide tipped print pen, known as a Bravo pen in many circles, they can oftentimes fill out that census questionnaire because they're gonna know what they're writing and they may be far more at ease in uh, desiring to fill it out. So these are just some of the ways that to outreach to our community. Um, I will give you my email and phone number as well, um, because you can also do it through the advocacy organizations, including mine, the California Council of the Blind, and the other major advocacy organization, the National Federation of the Blind of California. My email is J S for Stephen, T H O M at Comcast.net. And my phone number is 916-995-3967. And I thank you very much, uh, and I hope that this information has been enlightening. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, if you wouldn't mind repeating that phone number again? Yes, 916-995-3967. Great, thank you. Um, our next speaker um, is going to be tag teaming it. Uh, we have Leroy Moore, who is a board member uh, of Disability Board. I'm sorry, Associate Leroy Moore, <laughs> losing my screen. Board member of Disability Voices United, and also founder of Crip Hop Nation. Uh, along with him is Judy Mark, who is president of Disability Voices United. And she's also a faculty member of UCLA Disability Studies Department. With that, mm -hmm. so, oh. hello, how's everybody doing? So I'm Leroy Pinkham Moore Jr., founder of Group Out Nation and board member of Disability Voices United, also a journalist of four magazines, and also a founder of the National Black. And I am Judy Mark. I'm um, founder and president of Disability Voices United, um, as well as uh, I teach in the Disability Studies Department at UCLA. Um, I'm mo most importantly, I'm the parent of a 22 year old young man with autism, um, and I live in Los Angeles. Yeah, because uh, I live in Berkeley, California, and I'm a person with a disability. 
So I'm going to get started just to explain developmental disabilities um, to folks who may not be familiar with it. So developmental disabilities um, include people with autism, cerebral palsy, uh, epilepsy, and intellectual disabilities, as well as disabilities that are like those, including some um, rare, rarer syndromes that uh, fall under those categories. Uh, the way that people um, get assistance in the state of California if they have a developmental disability is, is to get become eligible for something called a regional center. Uh, regional centers do not serve all people with developmental disabilities. There has to be a certain level of disability in which uh, to receive services. But there are over 330,000 people in the state of California who receive services through regional centers. Regional center, there are 21 regional centers throughout the state of California, um, and they're based ge ge by geography. Um, there are, for example, seven in Los Angeles County alone. Uh, so um, they are all over the place, and they are the resource for people with developmental disabilities. That, um, often people, uh, children, even babies get diagnosed with developmental disabilities at regional centers, and they receive um, case management over their lifetime and are entitled to services from birth to death. Um, they, uh, regional centers have uh, contact information for all 330,000 people that they serve um, and I believe will be a great resource um, for the census. So, you have since in 1980 changed my life. Why? Because for the first time, it gave me a picture of black disabled people in the U.S. The late Frank Blow in 1980 did a statistical report drawn from Census Bureau data, looked at black, Hispanic, and women with disabilities for the first time. And these reports I carried around at school and at my volunteering jobs in um, disabled nonprofits to show the status of black disabled people. Since the 1980s, I see how important the U.S. Census for black and brown people with disabilities. And I always wanted to make sure my community would be a part of not only filling out, but helping put it together in doing outreach to make sure my community can not only fill it out, but understand <coughs> how the U.S. Census is so important for the community. 2019 is not 1980. With the growing population of black and brown elder elderly and young adults with disabilities that make up a huge percentage of the houseless population because of gentrification and incarceration. From school to prison pipeline to more and more cities passing anti-homeless laws like the California conservatorship law will and have increased black and brown poor disabled people being incarcerated in nursing homes. So it is important that the U.S. Census not only reach these populations, but include us as workers to spread the U.S. Census to these populations. Lastly, we all know that the U.S. Census have a huge impact on future funding. As a black disabled activist who worked and had my own nonprofit, this is huge for my black and brown disabled community in California to nationally to implement programs with stable funding. So how can we make sure that the U.S. Census will get to people in 
congregated settings such as group homes, institutions, hospitals, etc. We have to realize that this, that just like the U.S. presidential election every four years, in the U.S. census comes around every ten years, come with funding to help pass out and talk about the U.S. census. We all know that people with disabilities have the highest rates of unemployment. So it's another way to put money in people with disabilities pockets and at the same time to make sure people with disabilities will fill out the census. Go to the website www. 2002 census got go slash job. But how many people with disabilities know about these jobs in the website? Is the website accessible? My election poll is a nursing home. I think the U.S. Census can make one or more of their local places of distribution can be a hospital lobby, homeless shelter, nonprofit, disabled organization, et cetera. The U.S. Census can make paid positions like disability outreach coordinators that would have knowledge of the local disabled community. Also hooking up with mayors and governor's council on disability. Having an educational campaign a year out on mainstream media in ethnic newspapers led by people with disabilities. Using Frank Bowles' history with the U.S. Census. The most important in the above example of getting a disabled community involved is creating or building on an ongoing trustful relationship with disabled community with opportunities to get involved with the U.S. Thanks, Leroy. I'm going to give the parents' perspective. Um, so, in many cases, people with developmental disabilities um, have a, a intense parent involvement. Um, and so, it is to ensure that people with developmental disabilities are counted, we have to uh, reach out to the parents as well. Um, one of the challenges I think that we face is that parents are often unsupported and overwhelmed. And uh, because of that, they're just living sometimes day to day, sometimes minute to minute in providing the caregiving for their son or daughter with developmental disabilities. And, and so I think that we have to acknowledge that and that something like filling out a census form may not be the highest priority in their day, having, making sure that their child doesn't have a seizure or making sure that their child is safe it are, are their priorities for every day that they live. And so um, we have to make it easy and we have to encourage them and obviously um, a, appeal to them in places where they frequent. So um, I think it's important for us to reach out to those communities in which they, are, uh, they have trust. Um, that may be school districts, uh, special education, um, the teachers who teach within special education. It may be therapists um, and doctors and clinics where they may go. It, it may also be parent support groups, of which there are many. There are autism societies and Down syndrome associations that are run by parents um, that are important to do outreach with and get them to buy in to this important um, work of the, of the census. Um, and uh, as another big piece is this, are the regional centers, which I explained at the beginning. Regional centers are, have the contact information of 330,000 people with developmental disabilities and their family members. And um, I think it's really important 
to have them through their regular communication. Most of them communicate regularly with their clients um, and their clients' families. And it's really important to have them understand and to be part of this campaign to ensure that every person with a developmental disability is counted. Um, you know, they, there are 21 regional centers and they do things 21 different ways and they have 21 different mm -hmm. bureaucracies. So hence is, there is another challenge there. Um, we, uh, but I think that, that they would be open to this and I personally would commit to doing outreach to them. Um, the, but the, one of the things that's really important is that it, that parents often listen more to other parents than they do to professionals in the field. Um, I, as a parent, I can tell you some of the best information that I got to help my son is from other parents. And so therefore, um, I think it's really critical that we get to those peer support programs, parent support groups, um, and, and that it becomes, that the census becomes part of the everyday discussion that people have in the lives of families. Um, now the questions are, you know, do you have a good speech therapist or, you know, I need a dentist. These are the questions that are asked. There are so many listservs for parents that we have to make sure that part of that conversation on those listservs is also, oh, the census just came out. Did everybody fill out their forms? Um, if anybody needs some help, if anybody needs any encouragement. Um, the other thing I think is, is to point out something that Margaret had found in her focus group, and that is to keep things in plain language. It's not, I, I think it's, it's important to keep things in plain language, not just for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, but for everyone. I'm a big believer in plain language for all people. Um, if you are straightforward, if your communication is clear um, on why the census is important, um, why, what kinds of services are funded by, uh, by the count of the census, such as special education, regional centers themselves are funded 100% through government funds, so that, that is critical. Um, funding for Medi-Cal, I mean, these things that, that pay for behavioral therapy and for um, speech therapy and occupational therapy, physical therapy, these things are all funded by the census, and I think that we have to use plain language uh, communication with uh, these parents, some of whom have varying levels of education, um, obviously, uh, just like every other community represented here, we have a very diverse community of people with developmental disabilities. We have hundreds of languages, um, and so we have to make sure that we're reaching out um, and um, making sure that we're in the language that, that people feel comfortable in. Um, in addition, I think it's important to understand the immigration concerns of some families, and I'm sure that at the census, that's a big issue that people have been talking about in other webinars, but I think it plays a particularly uh, important role for families who have children with developmental disabilities. Um, so one thing that we should note is that people who are undocumented, who have developmental disabilities, have a right to services, just like any other person with a developmental disability in the state of California, they receive services funded through regional centers. Um, so therefore, we have a way to communicate with them, we have, we have the ability to reach out to them. But families who have either mixed immigration status or are undocumented face um, additional fears, because in many cases, people with developmental disabilities, children and adults, are really dependent on their families as, as caregivers. And if one of their caregivers is undocumented and there is that fear of making themselves known to the government, it, it, that fear is compounded when their child has a developmental disability. Um, so I think we're going to have to figure out how to provide um, levels of um, security and comfort for those individuals with immigration families so that we can ensure that, that this information um, is kept private and that there's no risk involved in filling out the census. Um, finally, just piggybacking on what um, Leroy said about um, ensuring that we hire people or people know about jobs who have disabilities, I think uh, hiring parents of uh, with peers of people with developmental disabilities is a great way to do that peer-to-peer -peer support. Having someone who's um, working on the census who, who has a child with autism, for example, can go to other parents and say, yeah, I know, I face those same struggles. My time is very um, difficult and I'm constantly worrying about caregiving. 
but um, I made this time. I understand it just takes a few minutes and, and to really prioritize this. So I, I think that, that we need to do outreach to a lot of the parent organizations um, when, high, when the hiring is uh, conducted to ensure that parents are also um, hired as well. Yeah, I, I want to end with that. You know, it, it makes sense, you know, to hire people with disabilities. But, you know, we suffer from extraordinary high um, unemployment rates and need, you know, these jobs. We are great workers. We, we you should want your census worker to truly reflect the community. And also, it moves the state toward the inclusion of all kinds. Thank you so much, Leroy and Judy, for all those wonderful information. How many people with developmental disabilities are in California? Do you think? 330,000 received services from regional centers. There's probably, um, studies have said 800 or 900,000 okay. in total, because there's a whole bunch who don't receive services. That's California. California alone. Okay. All right, um, we are fortunate to have our next speaker, Danielle Zavala, and she's the Associate Director and General Counsel for NoCal MHA, Mental Health America, Program Director in Access California. Yeah, so um, my name is Danielle Zavala. I am um, the Associate Director and General Counsel at Mental Health America of Northern California. We go by NorCal MHA. Um, I first want to start off by thanking the organizers um, for bringing us all together. I feel very honored to be a panelist amongst um, these amazing individuals who are out there doing the hard work um, representing their communities. So I'm very proud to sit at this table with everyone. Um, I also want to thank the public participants uh, for tuning in and um, you know, appreciate the interest uh, in this subject matter because it is quite important. Um, so, as I mentioned, my name is Danielle Zavala. Um, I'm the Associate Director and General Counsel at Mental Health America of Northern California. I'm also the Program Director for a statewide advocacy um, program of ours called Access California, which I'll talk about a little while later. Um, so, we, NorCal MHA is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the lives of residents in the diverse communities of California through advocacy, education, research, and culturally relevant peer support services. In all of our programs, we work with individuals and families um, with mental health challenges to pr promote wellness and recovery, prevention, and improved access to services and support. So while our agency still has NorCal in our name, um, we're actually a statewide organization with advocacy and education programs operating throughout California for the better part of a decade. So, I'm going to focus um, a little bit on the statistics of prevalence of um, mental health disorders uh, amongst California populations and talk about why that matters um, in the census and uh, the types of programs that are affected um, for the individuals who are served um, in the public mental health system in California. So according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, or SAMHSA, uh, nearly one in five adults in California reported experiencing a mental illness which is a diagnosable mental, behavioral, or emotional disorder other than a developmental or substance use disorder. And this was in fiscal year 2016 uh, to 2017. So during that same year, SAMHSA reports that nearly 4% of adults in the state experienced a serious mental illness, which is defined as any mental health disorder resulting in a serious functional impairment. Now, all evidence indicates the prevalence of both um, any mental illness and severe mental illness in California has continued to rise for at least a decade. So if you compare SAMHSA's data um, for California, collected in fiscal years 2008-2009 uh, and 2016-2017, um, it also supports this upward trend. The information reveals that the prevalence of serious mental illness among all adults in California rose from 3.2% um, in fiscal year 08-09 to 3.94%, or nearly 4%, in fiscal year 16-17. The greatest increase um, was found in young adults ages 18 to, 18 to 25, whose percentages jumped in the fiscal year 08-09 um, from 3.62% to 6.61% um, in fiscal year 16-17. 
So likewise, incidence of any mental illness, but not just severe mental illness um, for California adults also rose during this period from 17.44% in fiscal year 08-09 to 18.8% in fiscal year 16-17. Again, with the greatest in increase amongst young adults ages 18 to 25, growing from 18.49% in 08-09 to 24.75% in 16-17. So California's public mental health system, you might hear me say PMHS um, as an acronym, prim primarily serves non-ACA or Affordable Care Act Medi-Cal enrollees and indigent populations who lack any form of health insurance. Um, in the 16-17 fiscal year, 6,313,485 California children and 8,220,974 adults were deemed Medi-Cal eligible meaning at least 14 million, over 14 million Californians are eligible for public mental health services. According to California's Department of Healthcare Services, again, sorry, another acronym, DHCS, um, <laughs> adults and children, uh, nearly 605,000 people, adults and children combined in California received specialty mental health services um, in the public mental health system in fiscal year 16-17. Uh, so this does not include the 605,000 people, does not include ACA insured um, or fee-for-service clients that are also served in the public mental health system. Um, DHCS predicts the number of Medi-Cal eligible uh, served individuals served in the public mental health system will continue to increase in the immediate future. Their forecast for fiscal year 18-19 will be over 686,000 people served in the public mental health system and for 1920, over 720,000 individuals served in the public mental health system. So mental illness um, is highly, chronic mental illness is highly correlated with poverty, unemployment, and homelessness. And this is not to mention comorbidity with other um, disabilities, such as physical health conditions, developmental disabilities, intellectual disabilities, and co-occurring disorders, um, where you have a mental health condition co-occurring with um, an alcohol or substance use disorder. So poverty, first of all. According to SAMHSA's um, 2015 National Survey of Drug Use and Health, an estimated 9.8 million adults aged 18 or over in the United States had a serious mental illness, including 2.5 million adults living below the poverty line. So essentially, 25% of individuals living with a severe mental illness um, are also living below the poverty line. The relationship between mental illness and poverty is complicated because poverty can intensify the experience of mental illness um, it can also increase the likelihood of onset of mental illness, but at the same time, experiencing a severe mental illness can increase the chances of living in poverty. Um, unemployment. So again, back to sta uh, SAMHSA statistics. statistics. In 2012, uh, among adults served in California's public mental health system, only 10% reported being employed, with 15% unemployed and 75% not participating in the labor force. So that was in 2012. Um, unfortunately, these statistics are getting worse, not better. So if we fast forward to three years later in 2015, um, among adults served in California's public mental health system, um, only 8.3% reported being employed with 12.3% unemployed and 79.4% not participating in the labor force. Um, finally, homelessness. Homelessness affects a sizable portion of persons living with serious mental illness. Um, and people who have severe mental illness are also at greater risk for hom homelessness in the general population. So back in uh, January of 2018, California's uh, point-in-time homeless, homeless population count um, revealed that 130,000 individuals were experiencing homeless in the state at that time, representing a quarter of the entire nation's homeless population. Um, so SAMHSA estimates that 20 to 25 percent of all homeless populations in the United States uh, lives with some form of severe mental illness. So if we take those numbers as correct, that means of the 130,000 homeless individuals in California, between 26,000 and 32,500 of them are living with a severe mental illness. Um, so we looked at prevalence of severe mental illness in homelessness populations, but now what about the prevalence of homelessness in the public mental health system clients? So a 2005 study of individuals served in the California's public mental health system found that 15% were homeless at least once in a one-year period. If this finding still holds true, then in fiscal year 16-17, 
90,731 individuals, or 15% of all those served in the public mental health system were homeless at some point during that year. So since 2016, though, California has experienced a larger increase in homelessness than any other state. Nearly 70% of um, the state's homeless population is unsheltered, meaning that um, they're not util utilizing temporary living arrangements um, provided either by charitable or organizations or government programs. Rather, they're uh, living on the streets, in parks, or in other places that are not intended for human habitation. So, Given all the data and statistics that I've cited, um, individuals living with mental health conditions and particularly those living with severe mental illness are highly dependent upon programs that rely on federal funding, such as Medicaid, Section 8 housing vouchers, um, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program or SNAP, uh, State Children's Health Insurance Program, Supplemental Insurance for Women, Infants and Children, Special Education, just to name a few. Uh, counting everyone living with chronic mental health conditions, especially those who um, are difficult to find, is critical to secure the necessary federal funding to serve California's growing populations experiencing both homelessness and severe mental illness. Um, so there are barriers, unfortunately, to um, not just locating the individuals, but also ensuring that they're counted. So um, primarily, individuals experiencing mental illness can be hard to locate. As I mentioned, they may be homeless, um, they may be transient or um, experience other unstable living conditions. They might be um, in an inpatient, inpatient hospitalization um, clinic, both short-term and long-term. Uh, they might be living in a boarding care, supported housing, crisis residential, um, or they may be under conservatorship. So there are some barriers that are unique also to the mental health community. Um, the first being that uh, a great number of individuals are residing in um, state prisons and county jails. So a Stanford University study from 2016 concluded that in the past decade, the percentage of state prisoners with mental illness has increased by 77%. The same study found that over 30% of California prisoners um, currently receive treatment for a, a serious mental disorder which is an increase of 150% since 2000. Um, so in total numbers in 2016, 37,907 inmates received treatment for a serious mental illness. And um, it's estimated that these uh, figures are actually uh, lower and they continue to, lower than uh, the actual numbers and they continue to climb. Now, as far as county jails are concerned, um, in fiscal year 2016, 2017, over 76,000 individuals um, residing in a county jail uh, were received mental health services, um, many of them involuntary, but most of them um, voluntary outpatient treatment services within the jail system themselves. So if you look at both the prison population and the jail population, it's almost 114,000 Californians um, living with severe mental illness who are incarcerated. Um, Individuals with severe mental illness are also subject to other involuntary detentions. So uh, going back to the data, so in 2016-2017, in, um, uh, DHDS reports that 191,346 adults uh, experienced an involuntary detention, which could be 72-hour holds, 14-day intensive treatment, 30-day intensive treatment, 180-day post-certification intensive treatment programs, okay? And um, also in fiscal year 16, 17, over 7,000 adults in California were under temporary or permanent conservatorship for a severe mental illness. Um, as with other communities, um, stigma is uh, a big problem with the mental health community because mental illness is wrongfully associated with violence, criminality, substance use, um, homelessness, and uh, obviously NIMBYism um, pushes people with severe mental illness to the margins of society, lim limiting their public participation and community inclusion. Um, also, so that's from kind of the outside in, but also from the inside out, there's a, a strong mistrust of authority within the mental health um, consumer culture, um, because we have to remember that the consumer movement was founded during the civil rights movement of the 1960s um, as a responsive measure to the harsh and, um, and uh, 
<laughs> uncivil um, practices, um, psychiatric treatments um, were impose, imposing upon individuals with mental illness. So this mistrust of authority is, um, stems from being subject to involuntary treatment. Um, even in um, voluntary programs, there are also compliance conditions that are frequently placed on individuals who are receiving services. So if, for instance, individuals don't want to receive medication, then they get cut off from all other services. Um, there's also a strong incidence of criminalization of behaviors and circumstances that are associated with their illness, like anti-camping or anti-homelessness ordinances, um, law enforcement interactions. And um, this is huge because in, in most communities in California, uh, someone cannot just walk in and receive um, crisis mental health services. They either have to go to an ER or they have to be taken to um, an inpatient treatment uh, unit by law enforcement, which is um, extremely traumatizing. So some of the solutions that I have and recommendations um, to ensure that individuals with mental illness are counted are to work with um, state prisons, county jails, county mental health systems, um, county conservators, in actually locating the individuals who are receiving services um, within their programs. Also, wellness and recovery centers, community centers, um, and community engagement campaigns will go a long way, um, especially if you uh, are able to locate uh, liaisons from the mental health and also diverse cultural communities to establish trust and credibility and help and support individuals in completing the census. Um, to locate those individuals, uh, NorCal MHA, my organization, um, our Access California program has over 20 Access Ambassadors. These are all individuals located throughout the state. Um, they all have experience um, with the public mental health system. They know how it works. Most of them have received services in the public mental health system. Um, and their goal is to engage the community and build advocacy networks within um, their, their locale to ensure that people are um, participating in the uh, mental health planning process. So they already have established roots within the community and they have credibility um, to establish that trust with um, individuals receiving services. Um, you can also rely on connecting with other statewide mental health advocacy organizations. So um, like NAMI, um, California Youth Connection, um, Veterans Associations, uh, United Parents and Health Access Foundation. Um, county designated consumer advocates, many county, county mental health systems have individuals who are working within their system who have received services in the system who represent the consumer voice. So they know uh, the community very well and they're able to connect um, individuals with resources and um, providers who can help get people to respond to the census. Um, county patients rights advocates uh, may be also a good avenue in locating individuals to complete the census community mental health workers, um, and local mental health advocacy organizations. So Mental Health America has several chapters throughout California, and uh, NAMI has numerous chapters um, through many, throughout many communities in California. So um, I appreciate all of that. Uh, I thank you for hearing me out. Uh, my contact information, should you wish to reach out to me, um, is my first initial, so D, and last name Zavala. So it's Z is in zebra, A, V is in Victor, A, L, A, D, Zavala, at norcalmha.org. Or you can call me. Um, my telephone number is 916-366-4600. Um, I will provide a copy of my statement to the organizers. So if individuals are interested in where I found these numbers and what the actual statistics are. I'm going to update my um, comments and provide that information for dissemination to all of the participants. Um, I may not be around after everyone is presenting because I have to run to another meeting. But again, I really appreciate the opportunity. It is um, very much an honor to be here today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Danielle. You're um, and to add on to the list of services that individuals with mental health um, can benefit from that is uh, that census data are used. It includes block grants for community mental health services. Uh, it includes um, supportive housing for mm -hmm. people with disabilities, uh, protect, protection and advocacy for individuals with mental illness, uh, support employment services for individuals with significant disabilities. Mm -hmm. So the list goes on and on. Mm -hmm. I mean, we cannot emphasize enough why people with disabilities matter right. and we count and 
this panel is helping us and helping uh, those who are on this uh, webinar to better and more effectively outreach to the disability community. We have so excited to be able to share with you Christina. Uh, Christina Mills is um, the Executive Director of California Foundation for Independent Living Centers. Before she starts, um, I want to just make sure that everyone understands she had a big role in her team, uh, Kyla being behind the camera uh, and helping us put this um, webinar together, so also thank you for that. So we are going to close off with Christina. And the questions, um, because we have limited time with the panelists, I'm going to concentrate more on the questions for the panelists because the census staff will be available all the time and you can email the census staff questions uh, related to census outreach but I would re request that questions from the attendees target actually the panelists because we have them here today but that Christina wonderful thank you sewing um, I just want to start by first saying thank you to sewing and disability rights California as well as you me and the complete count staff who have made today's webinar possible um, it's been our pleasure at the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers to work in partnership with both of them and all of today's panelists to bring you this very informative webinar on how to include people with disabilities across um, the state of California. And with that, um, before I launch into my formal presentation, I do want to point out that we are very fortunate, I feel, in California to be in a state where disability has been prioritized as another underserved community on top of what the federal government had put out to the states um, initially. And we wouldn't have been able to do that without an appointment of somebody representing the disability community. So again, thank you, Sewing, for representing our community on the governor's um, census committee and making sure that our voices are heard. While people with disabilities are um, certainly a part of every uh, diverse ethnic, religious, gender group uh, in the world, there are still a number of reasons why our community needs to be separated as its own underserved community, and the census is one of those. So I'm happy to be here today, and again, I'm uh, with the California Foundation for Independent Living Centers, CFILC. Uh, we are a membership organization that is an association that represents 22 of California's 28 independent living centers. Independent living centers are advocacy organizations that offer a wide variety of services to people of all ages and all types of disabilities across California. In addition to being an association uh, for our members, CFILC also provides seven statewide programs that increase independent living options for individuals while building the capacity of our independent living centers as well. For over five years, I want to say almost six years, CFILC has been working in collaboration with the California Emerging Technologies Fund and the World Institute on Disability to help close the digital divide for people with disabilities. Through our digital access project, CFILC has assisted over 3,200 individuals with disabilities and getting connected to affordable internet options. However, research indicates that 25% of disabled people still do not have internet access in their own home. Given that the upcoming census, the 2020 census, is going to be primarily offered online and for the first time, affordable internet access is going to be a much more critical part of making sure that people are counted, especially in our community. CFILC's Digital Access Project can assist individuals who want and need low-cost internet in their homes. If you'd like to learn more about that program, please visit our website at digitalaccessproject.org. Again, that's www.digitalaccessproject.org. In addition to internet access, I'd like to encourage participants to engage with their local disability community partners. Independent Living Centers, Aging and Disability Resource Connections, and Traumatic Brain Injury Centers can be disability outreach resources and assist you in creating accessible strategies to reach our community. These organizations are known and trusted service providers that can be a wealth of knowledge. Not to mention the fact that Independent Living Centers have been around for 40 years, and of course I'm going to tend to focus on um, our centers because that's what I know best, but they are uh, very unique in the sense that we are uh, run by and for people with disabilities. 
So the funding that we get to exist uh, requires us to have 51% of our staff, as well as our board, be people with disabilities across the, the span of disability um, communities. So people with disabilities are defined as hard to reach and underserved uh, for a variety of reasons. Not everyone who has a disability looks disabled, quote, but may need additional support when it comes to participating in the census process. Thinking about disability access from the beginning of a process instead of an end will benefit everyone. When developing outreach strategies, think about how to make your virtual and in-person activities accessible. Something as simple as adding a reasonable accommodation statement, such as, for reasonable accommodations, please contact so-and-so on your forms or materials, will let people with disabilities know that you've taken access into consideration and are proactively planning for people with disabilities to be included. Statements like that make us feel invited as well. Of course, that means you also need to know how to offer accommodations, and that can be, um, that can be a benefit of partnering with your local disability organizations to make that happen. Um, today, in fact, our partnership with Display Rights California and Complete Count um, through our resources and join network was able to provide you with the most accessible webinar that you're uh, participating in today. And the chances are when you make your uh, event or your online virtual activities accessible from the beginning, you're making it more accessible for people that didn't even know um, that that was something that could be offered. So as an example of that, um, we work a lot in independent living, especially um, this year with the aging community. And in those efforts, we're finding that many people in the aging community didn't know that they could request large print or that captioning could be something that could be provided. And they're finding that it's very useful and something that they wish they would have known about earlier. So again, planning for those things in advance helps everyone, not just people with disabilities. Programmatic and physical access is important to all census-related activities. People with disabilities will want to be want to feel like we're included, and we don't want to feel like we're an afterthought. We've heard a lot of uh, panelists speak about specific populations of our community today, but I want to leave you with five tips that will help you move forward in reaching people with disabilities across the lifespan. Uh, these are in addition to the local disability organizations that I've also encouraged you to partner with. One, when creating materials, make them readable for a wide audience. Our rule of thumb at CFILC is to try and make our materials no more than a fifth grade reading level so that anybody can participate and understand what we're saying. Two, I mentioned this earlier, but adding that accommodation statement to your website and materials, not to mention making your accessible your website accessible from the beginning is also uh, key to being inviting for our community. Three, make sure that um, when you are providing a local um, activity or event for folks to be a part of, that you understand um, what the needs of the community are. So for example, making sure that if you're going to invite people to speak at your event that use wheelchairs, that you have a stage, or you have a ramp for your stage, or if you're having, um, one of the biggest misconceptions I see a lot is that uh, folks will speak louder and say, I don't need a microphone and often don't realize that using a microphone is an access piece. And it might mean that somebody in the room is hard of hearing or someone in the room isn't willing to, to disclose that they're hard of hearing or deaf, um, but really rely on that microphone in order to understand what's happening. Four, before you create an online registration form or subscribe to a service, such as a webinar platform, today we're using Zoom, make sure it's accessible. Make sure that it can include captioning, that captioning can be embedded like we're seeing today, and that it's screen reader accessible. Are the slides accessible as well? When you're viewing a PowerPoint, make sure that those slides are accessible for the screen reader who's participating in the webinar too. Um, ways to do that are to partner with your disability organizations, many of which who shared valuable um, information from their specific points of view today. And five, when hosting an outside event um, out, outside of your organization or at a community center, make sure that the place is near a bus stop. 
many people with disabilities rely on public transportation. And being able to get to a location because it's near a bus stop makes it much easier for us to participate. Also make sure that the space has uh, an accessible restroom. Um, make sure that everyone um, will have equal access and the seating in the facility will be integrated, meaning that not everybody with a disability will be pushed off to the side. Um, that often happens for me as a wheelchair user. Wheelchair users will be in the back row and we'll have a section for a small group of us, but we can't get around anywhere else in the conference or in the room. So making sure that integrated seating is also encompassed in your event. Again, these are just some of the tips I wanted to bring to you today. There are many more um, that you can learn by partnering with our local disability organizations, both independent living centers and those that uh, presented here today. Thank you again for inviting CFILC to be a part of today's presentation, and I do look forward to partnering with many of you across the state as you reach out to people with disabilities and make sure that we're counted. Great. Thank you so much, Christina. So, um, We'll have give people a moment to get back to their seats. Um, we want to make sure we know that included in those who are attending are individuals who are um, tasked with outreaching to diverse communities, including uh, communities of people with disabilities. Um, that said, we want to prioritize those questions so that we can maximize the use of panelists' knowledge and resources. We will also want to let those who are attending know that we're putting together a robust resource list uh, that includes the different um, disability communities and how um, the contact information for those diverse um, organizations. Um, that said, uh, let's go ahead and open it up for questions. And again, um, we have Sherry. And we're lucky to have all the panelists we have here today. So Sherry has a wealth and you know she's just a wealth of knowledge and connection to the deaf, uh, deaf blind part of hearing community. So if you have questions related to that community, I would welcome those questions. Of course, Margaret and all the knowledge that she's gained through the toolkit, she knows what messages work, at least for the population that was, um, uh, um, what was the word I'm looking for? Tested. Tested. <laughs> Surveyed. <laughs> Surveyed. <laughs> so there's a lot of good information that's here around the table. Jeff Tom has been um, a leader in the blind communities and have great knowledge around all the issues that may come about. So we want to maximize his knowledge. Um, and of course, Judy and Leroy, um, with all the years of involvement in the developmental disability communities, um, Christina and, and all your knowledges, I mean, in protests including, right, to ensure that people with disabilities have rights that they need. So we have a lot of resources around the room uh, that I'm encouraging those who are in attendance to, um, to make use of. Okay, so the question we have is, uh, uh, how do you suggest an individual with a physical disability who has limited ability to write or the inability to write fill out the census material? So this is Christina um, from CFILC. Uh, you know, I think that um, there's, there's positive and I don't want to say negative, but maybe challenges in the fact that the census is going to be offered online for the first time in 2020. And so it's not just going to be about a pen and paper. It's also going to be about computer access. And um, through the outreach and uh, census processes that are um, currently being planned to make sure that uh, folks who don't have computer access have computer access and are able to take it electronically in the future um, will really make a significant difference for those that have um, limited dexterity. So even if somebody doesn't have internet in their home, I know that um, through my work and research so far um, with some of my census partners, that there's going to be uh, what I'm referring to as census hub sites, where folks that don't have uh, internet access or don't have uh, accessibility in their own home to use a computer to do the census online could go to an organization such as an independent living center that might become a census hub site to use their free equipment in their consumer workstations, which majority of them have, um, with software and accessible features 
to take the census um, at a hub site rather than individually in their own home or maybe at a facility that doesn't have uh, height adjustable tables or uh, screen reader software and other forms of um, technology that'll make it more accessible for you to take the census online. So um, while we're really pushing for a lot of people to get internet access and be able to do it independently because we know that uh, that's certainly a, a choice that many of us have, um, we also want to make sure that when that's not possible because of fixed incomes and you know living off of let's say SSI and $920 a month, it's probably really challenging to be able to get internet in your own home even at an affordable rate. And, and so in those instances, we really want to make sure that we have partnering organizations that are offering computers and um, sites where you can come in and get support, whether that be using the computer, doing it in writing. That's some of the services that independent living centers have historically offered, and that's part of what we would consider um, individual advocacy support. And um, there was a comment that says, um, this is the most accessible webinar I've ever been part of, Access is Love. So we, we want to ensure that People with disabilities are counted. There's too much at stake. So to ensure that we get the messages to as wide an audience as possible, we did all we could to make sure that this is the most successful so we can reach as many folks out there as possible. Um, and what about people under conservative? Do they get to be counted and how do you ensure that they are counted? I know for a fact it is in the Constitution that everybody is counted. It does not matter. Every person is counted. It does not matter where you are, who you are, documented or undocumented, in prison or out of prison, without or not. with disability, conserved or not conserved, um, transgender or cisgender, everybody is counted. Um, so all questions relating to will this person be counted because they are in this institution? Will that person be counted because they're this particular status? The answer is always going to be yes. The answer is yes because it's required under the Constitution that everybody is counted. And we have to give him greater efforts because there's, there's going to be barriers in the way. There's access barriers, attitudinal barriers. You know, with that, if I can have maybe Margaret, um, if you can share again those messages, I think there were three that resonated the most with people with disabilities. If you can. Sure. Let me find them again. Don't have them memorized. Uh -huh. um, the first one was the 2020 census. The disability community is counting on you. The second one was the 2020 census and disability. Everyone deserves to be counted. And the third one was why the disability community matters when counting the 2020 census. And again, the hashtag was hashtag disability count 2020. Excellent. So we've done some work with folks around this table even to make the jobs of those who've been tasked with outreach to diverse communities a lot easier for you. So for sure, we're gonna have the PowerPoint that Margaret used to present. We're also gonna have the toolkit that has all the information and all the wealth of knowledge that they've gained from the surveys and the testing that have been done. And of course, the resource list is going to include everyone's material, including any speeches that were presented today. Do you mind if I just go back to that question about conservatorship real sure. quick? Um, so, I just because it's a little um, obsession of mine. Um, so, I think what's important to think about with conservatorship is that, you know, many people who are conserved are conserved. Um, well, the court conserves them, but the court appointed conservator is a family member. And um, and so we have to reach out to that family member like we'd reach out to any family member of a person with a disability. Um, and many of the people who are conserved are people with intellectual disabilities, which is, which is why um, Leroy and I have, have a lot of concerns about this. The, the area that I think we have to really focus on are those people who are conserved by professionals or people other than their family members. And to ensure that that individual gets counted, um, even if they don't have a family member who's speaking for them. Um, and I think that there are some ways that we can think about that. And, and I'm really glad the question came up because I hadn't thought about it until the question came up, is that there are um, 
there, there are professional associations of conservators and there are probate courts that work with professional conservators um, that I think are really important to reach out to, to ensure that the, that the thousands and thousands of people who have professional conservators are, are counted as well. And so um, one of the issues is that, you know, we're not sure how seriously they're going to take this as professional conservators. Um, and, and so I think there's going to be an education that we're going to need to be doing with them. And do you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I, I wanted to add, um, nothing about the conservatorship program. Um, having an advocate with institutions to do this, and to, you know, like nursing homes and other places that that um, that need that push from um, advocacy to to do it. Like I said, in my speech, um, you know, since this could have a speech in a nursing home, you know, or at a hospital, right there, could be an easy way. So, Leroy, since um, we have you, one of the questions that we need peers in the disability community to be part of the outreach, the training, and the actual work for the 2020 census work. Could you share why that would be important and how they can best ensure that they involve peers? Yeah, peers is so important because, like, like I said, when I saw the U.S. Census in 1980 and I saw that report, you know, it, it looked like me, you know. So, you know, because of that, I wanted to get involved. And I think it's really important now because our peers can really, um, you know, educate the U.S. citizens on how to to really build up that trust factor in the disabled community. Mm -hmm. You know. So, can I add about conservatorship? Sure. Yeah. Yes, we'll have Margaret and then Sharon will go next. Just a lot of people with mental health disabilities are also on conservatorships. I'm not sure who the person that asked the question was. You know, they were talking about people with developmental disabilities or people with mental health disabilities. So people um, on conservatorships are often in facilities um, or in state hospitals. So I think that when we're thinking about how to do that outreach, we need to give you all resources on who to contact generally about reaching out to state hospitals or who generally to reach out to about facilities where people with mental health disabilities are, are living. Um, I like the idea of reaching out to nursing homes as well, because there may be people uh, with dementia or other kinds of disabilities that are on conservatorships that might be living in nursing homes on conservatorships as well. So um, we are trying to put together this resource thing, so I'm just thinking another component of that might be um, giving some resources for people to actually reach out and be able to ensure that those folks are counted as well. And what does it mean to be under conservatorship? It means your rights are taken away and somebody else makes decisions for you. And it also depends on the type of conservatorship, of course. And it happens oftentimes, and sometimes for individuals with developmental disabilities. It's very it common. Mm -hmm. for individuals yeah. with Unfortunately, too common, but very right. common. Right. So part of what we're speaking here is to ensure that Regardless of whether a person is considered or not, their right to be counted should not be discounted. Mm -hmm. That we should count everyone and making greater efforts to count individuals who are concerned so that they know that regardless of their status, they are to be counted and they can be involved in the process. Mm -hmm. All right, Sherry, uh, I want to turn. Yes, definitely. I just want to also remind people that online is one thing, but it's still, um, they do have surveys that are on paper that people can fill out with an individual who can assist them with different documentation, such as translation or um, oh, some people, um, and uh, some people are very concerned about the system being hacked and as you are aware um, that issue uh, regarding the election so yeah, what's not to say that it's going to happen again in the census collection um, 
people feel that sometimes uh, paper data has a stronger effect. Uh, whether that's accurate or not, we're not sure, but it's easier to internet for the access to pe for people. We do understand that. Um, the rural areas, uh, quite often, they don't have the internet access, and if they do, it's not as reliable. Uh, so we have to take that into consideration that regardless of where or who, um, it is important that there are different ways and different opportunities to make sure that you are counted. Right. And this is so speaking, and the reason why this panel is so important is that the state doesn't control uh, the enumeration, the counting process, and the giving out the census. The federal government controls that. And their decisions on their part to make it electronic is very problematic for many groups, poor communities, language communities, disability communities, as we're speaking about today, who may have limited access or no access to internet. And so the outreach that the state itself has to do to these communities, knowing they're going to have those challenges, is going to be why it's going to be that much more important. Um, we know that it's coming. We know that they're going to lean more towards do it electronically. And I think they're going to try to do it. If there's not a response to the electronic process, there's still a paper process. But that's a second process. That's not how they're going to target it first. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a barrier for a lot of our diverse intersectional communities. Someone has stated, um, that they appreciate those distinctions and whether they can be repeated. Uh, transgender or sex gender, yes. Anyone, regardless of status, whether you're transgender, whether you're gay, lesbian, straight, bisexual, questioning, your status itself doesn't matter. Everyone is counted. Uh, whether you're a person uh, with a disability or without, whether you're uh, a parent, a child, Oftentimes, who also gets uh, uncounted are, are children, children and babies. Everyone counts. I cannot stress enough. Everyone counts. So regardless of what institutions you're in, if you're homeless, you are counted. If you're housed, you are counted. If you're, you know, under a bridge, in a hospital, in prison, in jail, I mean, any institution under conservatives, under conservatorship, in a group home, in a supportive living situation, regardless of any status, any situation, if you live in California, you will be and you should be counted. And the reason why we are all here today is to share what is at stake. There's too much at stake not to be counted. And this, this information, the data that's going to be used for the census is going to help shape and determine finances, resources, structures, where hospitals are to be built, where schools are to be built for the next 10 years. And it will not happen again until 2030. Um, Jeff, I think Jeff, you you may have, you, you were, yeah. um, had a point to make. Yes, um, I, I just wanna say that, you know, obviously we will, we would hope to have many organizations who would assist people filling out questionnaires um, for a variety of reasons. But I think it's important when you perform that function to be a scribe and not to, um, uh, not to sort of use that subconscious willingness to suggest what the person with a disability should put on the form. That tends to happen far more than you realize and uh, you know, it is it is not it is not intentional. Oftentimes, it is an effort to help, but it is a misplaced effort. It is the person with a disabilities form, not the person who's filling it out. And it's important that that person understand that. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Jeff. And so, the my understanding is that this is silly. My my understanding is that the, the federal government is going to be sending folks uh, essentially a, a letter or a postcard that gives their identifier, and then they go on the, the website and fill out the census information. So it's not necessarily that um, they're sending it to you by email. Right. Um, and then the, the, one of the questions is, is um, uh, in addition to Margaret's research um, through DREDIF and through DRC with the, um, with the generous funding from the foundation, um, 
are there any of the panel are there any other that the panelists are aware of uh, that research uh, documenting an undercount of people with disabilities in the decennial census? And if the response is no, that also tells you there is a need. Uh, the fact that the federal government did not designate people with disabilities as a hard account population mm -hmm. tells you where we're at. Uh, as you can hear from the panelists, uh, there are a lot of issues that may get in the way if not for the appropriate accommodations or the appropriate thoughts to ensure that people with disabilities are counted. So that I would, for all that are listening in the audience, I would put this out there as there needs to be greater funding. Can we, can we, Margaret, can you share which foundation it was that provided that funding for the, the research at the DRC and, and, um, yeah, California Community Foundation? Okay, so we want to applaud California Community Foundation and we would encourage and challenge other foundations, other organizations, for profit businesses to, uh, ensure mm -hmm. that people with disabilities, um, tested, surveyed, you know, to, to see what their needs are to make sure that they're counted. So we thank the California Foundation for their leadership and also for their generosity for the funding of the surveys. Can I, I add something? Sure, you? Christina. Um, I, I know we're getting close to closing and there's two things that I, I really think are important about continuing this conversation after today among us and participants and as the work continues to grow as we hope uh, it does because this webinar will be archived which we'll learn a bit more about. But I think it's really important that we continue to use the hashtag Disability Census 2020 mm -hmm. to keep this conversation going and to make sure that we're holding um, the census uh, process and those responsible um, accountable to making sure that they're including and becoming inclusive of our community through all of the different activities and events that happen uh, moving forward through uh, 2020. And secondly, um, I would be remiss if I did not bring up that um, the Disability Organizing Network, which is another program of CFILC, is doing community organizing work around census. And we have many of our systems change advocates from across the state and community organizers participating in today's webinar. And I know that many of them have uh, been working hard to partner with their local regional census uh, organizations that were recently funded and identified. So I really do hope that um, all of you do get a chance to connect. And again, just using that hashtag, uh, hashtag disability counts. counts, sorry, disability counts 2020 um, is going to be essential for us making sure how our community is continuing to be involved as we move forward. And Christina, thank you for that. What we'll make sure to include as part of the resource materials, along with the, the toolkit, along with the PowerPoints, and it will be in Word and PDF, along with the resource list. Uh, there are two others I want to share. So as Christina mentioned, each county has its own census census committee. So we'll ensure that each county's contact info, so for those who are attending and want to be involved, we'll share the contact information uh, of those individuals as well so that you can tap into your own county to be involved. We need more people with disabilities in all facets of this local, state, all level of this. Uh, and the more we're visible, the more we're seen, the more our voices are heard, the more we will be counted. And the other resource I want to share also is that CPAN, which is the Census Policy Advocacy Not Network, uh, also produced uh, some materials, including uh, fact sheets. Um, and we will include that as part of the materials as well. Um, are there any other materials that we're aware of that we, we, we think would be helpful for those who are Tasks of reaching out to people with disabilities or want to ensure that they count people with disabilities? Uh, this is Christine again. I'll just briefly add that um, Sewing, you did a wonderful job of collecting a variety of different contact lists from each of us as panelists. And I know that um, I mentioned a number of organizations in my presentation, and that will be included in the toolkit that Sewing will be um, making accessible to all of us. So while I mentioned a lot of them um, vaguely and broadly, the individual uh, local organizations with contact information will be included in the toolkit. Billing, did you also mention the 2020 Census Community Outreach Toolkit? That's another place to look. I don't know if it's specific to people with disabilities, but it does include oh, good information. Please speak about it. That's, I think, a great additional resource. That's all I know. 2020 <laughs> Census Community Outreach Toolkit. Our um, 
toolkit, the one uh -huh. that's focused on disability, includes uh -huh. a link to it. Okay. Under additional resources. Great. So okay. once you get our toolkit, you'll have uh, access to that. Excellent. And I, I want to thank the generosity of all the panelists here also who've been who are willing to be the person that can help people connect to different diverse communities. And I'll throw myself in the mix. My name is Zoe Van. It's spelled T-H-O-V-I-N-H, B-A-N-H. And my email is T-H-O-V-I-N-H dot B-A-N-H at disabilityrightsca.org. That's T-H-O-V-I-N-H dot B-A-N-H at disabilityrightsca.org. Um, everyone's been so generous with their time, with their information the passion to ensure that people with disabilities are counted. Um, I, I, I think with that, maybe it'd be a nice place for closure. And I know we want to leave a little bit of time for Kevin. Thank you, Kevin, for all your hard work. And Laura, Laura and Kevin, for all your hard work to ensure um, that this went smoothly. Kevin, I'm going to turn this to you for closing remarks. Kevin, are you there? Thank you, Sewing. I just want to say that. Thank you for organizing and being our voice on the Census Committee. So. Thank you. I'm more than honored. Thank you, everyone, for including today's 2020 Census uh, Prevention on Including People with Disabilities. We hope that you found this information presented helpful, and we'll reach out to any of the presenters or organizations mentioned in today's webinar. Today's webinar will be archived on the Complete Count Disability Organizing on the Disability Organizing Network and Disability Rights California website within the next 10 to 14 days. Thank you everybody for attending and I hope you have a good day. Thank you. <laughs>